Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Everyday Anarchism. My guest today is Carl Gerth. Now, Carl is a professor of, of, of modern Chinese history. How would you describe yourself, Carl? Precisely that way. Okay. Carl is a professor of modern Chinese history at the uh, University of California at San Diego. But I know him from back when I was an undergraduate at the University of South Carolina in Columbia, South Carolina. And uh, I, Carl, I don't think we, we spoke after you and I both left the University of South Carolina. And then when I started making this podcast, I was getting back in touch with people. And actually, I'll just I'll talk a little bit before I let you talk. I'll just share with people. I got in touch with you because I, you know, always admired your work. I loved our class together. We chatted a bit afterwards um, after that class ended about the uh, deliberately satirical newspaper columns I was writing for the uh, Daily Gamecock, which luckily those are not online. Thank God. Hopefully no one can find them. And uh, I asked you for your feedback about the podcast, and you were just incredibly supportive and positive. Talked about your journey as an anarchist. You recommended Seriously Wrong to me, which if people have uh, have heard this show, my show, Everyday Anarchism, they probably found out about it through Serious, Seriously Wrong. I found about found out about Seriously Wrong from you. So I consider you, Carl, to be one of the main influences and one of the original supporters of everyday anarchism. So I am so glad that you've agreed to come on the show and and talk about anarchism and Mao with me. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on the show. And I found out about Seriously Wrong from Rev Left, a really open-minded uh, Marxist-Leninist kind of oriented podcast. Um, so shout out to them too. Yeah, I, I, I should tell your audience that you're exactly the same person now that I clearly remember from 20 plus years ago. You were, you, you know, back then I was just an assistant, prof freshly minted assistant professor and probably was teach, quote unquote teaching lots of stuff that I knew nothing about. And anything that I didn't, wasn't able to back up, I could be sure you'd, you'd challenge me on it. So yeah, it's, pr it's pretty remarkable to see how, um, independently minded and just intensely curious uh, you still are very ins inspiring for the rest of us i mean that's that's wonderful to hear i i try i mean let's 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 get into the mouse stuff and let me let me preface this a little bit i want most of the talking to be you but i can kind of get started on this so one thing to say is you know i do not come i did not come to anarchism the way i'm guessing most people do which is kind of through the radical left or through a, a, a communist or a socialist space, I was doing my best to be an Obama, Fukuyama, pragmatist, technocratic liberal. And I have always, and this hasn't changed, as listeners I'm sure know, have been utterly skeptical of so many of the socialist and, and communist projects of the 19th and 20th century. If someone said the word communism, I just knew, you know, the gulag lurked behind that. And it wasn't until I, I started reading David Graeber and he pointed me to Kropotkin and the anarchist tradition that I realized that there were people who could uh, plausibly descri be described as socialists or communists, but libertarian socialists or, or anarchist communists. So that was my journey to this <laughs> radical left position, although I try and be a you know friendly, moderate, pragmatic radical Leftists, and I have never dropped my my skepticism of the state socialist projects of the 20th century. But now that I travel in these circles, there's all sorts of sympathy, not for Stalin, but but Trotsky, Lenin. That's that's Vladimir Lenin, not John Lenin, who also has some thoughts on Mao. So uh, Trotsky, uh, Lenin, and and Mao. And when you and I were talking about this, I thought, oh, wow, here's someone who, who I share a lot of points of agreement with and actually knows what, what happened under Mao and can talk about Maoism and its potential connections or lack of connections to anarchism. So that's, that's me. That's, that's where I came from. And now I'll, I'll just turn it over to you. Well, I would say I have even in a, a less intellectual path leading to having anarchist sympathies i don't really label my, myself that um at all although uh, certainly the uh, wide-ranging way that you describe anarchism it's most people i think or quite a few people whether they know it or not would define themselves as such um i was I, i've been a historian of consumerism in china from the late 19th century to the present I've written three books on the history of consumerism cutting across that period 
And really, for me, I was studying it the way that most people as part of what we think of in history as the consumerist turn, namely, we knew all about the history of production and most of the history since the Industrial Revolution forward was about building more and more stuff, introducing more and more technology. And always the underlying assumption was if you build it, they will come, uh, kind of like in Field of Dreams. If you build it, they'll come. Uh, but the consumerist turn uh, about 20, 30 or so years ago now uh, said, well, you can't really assume people are going to want to exchange time and freedom for more, more and more stuff. You have to also simultaneously develop the techniques of getting people to want more and more stuff. So, yeah, I spent my kind of career looking at the introduction and spread of consumerism. And since I'll probably talk about that a whole bunch, let me make sure we're on the same page about what I mean by that. Uh, by consumerism, I mean the mass production of more and more things. So like take sugar water, Coca-Cola, and you start calling it Coca-Cola. So uh, the increasing production of more mass production of branded products like Coca-Cola, the spread through new forms of media of discourse or discussion or ideas about those goods, like somehow drinking Coca-Cola is not going to give you diabetes, but instead is going to add life or whatever their advertising jingo is at the time. And then finally, and this is really important, increasingly the communication both to yourself, who you are, and to others through the consumption of mass-produced branded products that I have in this type of car rather than that, that type of car signals both to myself and others that I'm a, this sort of person. I drive a Prius rather than a Rolls-Royce, for instance. Um, so yeah, I was just minding my own business, sort of documenting and looking at the spread of this. And it was really only with this third book about the Mao era from 1949 uh, to 1976, that is the pure win period when Mao Zedong controlled China, considered the kind of most radical uh, period of Chinese history. When I started to look at this concept uh, uh, in China and its persistence after 1949, it was really it, when people thought this disappeared, after all, they were trying to build this socialist egalitarian place. When instead, I saw exactly as Marx predicted, the spread of exactly the same inequalities that you see in every industrializing countries, that I sort of realized that there, this wasn't what I came to, what I concluded was an oxymoron, socialist consumerism, but rather consumerism was the demand side of industrial capitalism. And as I documented that side, I too began to realize, no, they weren't as they claimed building socialism on en route to their utopia, uh, communism, they were instead doing exactly what Marx predicted, introducing all of the inequalities um, um, that le le led to the explosion of inequalities that we see after Mao's death. So let me, I'll, I'll wrap up by saying what those inequalities are that Marx himself pointed would happen under industrial capitalism. So cities would be advantaged over the countryside, uh, mental work would be advantaged over manual labor. So someone, say a, a cadre managing a factory, would be advantaged over a poor woman in the countryside working in a field. Uh, and finally, factory work would be advantaged over uh, agricultural work. You could add, add issues of race and gender as well later, but those were the three original. And that's kind of important to remember because those inequalities were being taught to uh, Chinese across uh, across the country. So yeah, I'll, I'll start by saying again, by wrapping up by saying, like you, I didn't start out with a textbook idea of here's what I, uh, what I mean by anarchism and go and look for it. Instead, uh, I, I followed my material and came to the inescapable conclusion that no, I can't just use the word socialist or state socialist or actually existing socialist to call what I saw going on there because even by their own definition, I saw them building the opposite of what they said they were building. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I just want to reflect, I mean, I would guess most people who are listening to this probably have that well i feel like the agricultural thing if you're listening to this podcast you probably are, have some sympathy to a different way of doing agriculture and you know I've, I've spoken lots about different ways that we can grow things although you know we do love factories but my assumption is if you're a 21st century intellectual you know cities over the countryside and you know mental work over manual labor that's just sort of like a, a default when you read people praising blue states in the new york times you know they'll talk about knowledge workers and urban centers and high-tech manufacturing i mean i think these inequalities are seen less 
I would guess most people have just sort of absorbed these inequalities as good things. Certainly, if you if you are a, a, a a university professor or a big city lawyer or something like that, it's kind of crucial to your identity that this stuff is good and, and valuable and de- deserves to be held in, in better esteem than those, those other kinds of labor. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're touching on a lot of interesting things, but you're reminding me of one of my absolute favorite thing, things to introduce to people in history classes. And that is the idea that a lot of the things that we come up with when we're looking at the past isn't smarty pants historians with their 2020 glasses on, but were well known to people at that time. So China as a latecomer to industrial capitalism in the late 19th, early 20th century could see the whole 19th century history of the United States and other earlier uh, industrializing countries in Western Europe and see, oh my God, we're going to produce this type of society, the good as well as the bad. What can we do about that? So there were people in China experimenting with distributing industrialization, as of course the Chinese uh, Communist Party did during the Great Leap Forward of the late 1950s, beginning of 1960s, of saying, hey, let's put uh, factories, not in cities, but put them out where people actually are. So we don't have, you know, these giant urban slums and all of the sort of inequalities that have gone along with that everywhere else. Um, however, um, this is really important to kind of m- my own uh, work and own theme. What was the primary motivation for them doing that? Was it about inequality or was it about sucking up surplus labor power in the countryside and about using, uh, if you don't have a lot of technology, but you have a lot of labor power, why not put the factories in there as a way of squeezing that extra labor power uh, rather than seeing it as a form of great equalizer? It was, to my mind, another form of great extraction from the countryside to the cities. Yeah, so... Yeah, I, I agree with you. Not not only um, is this kind of these inequalities really interesting, but it was well known and well attempted by the Chinese Communist Party to constantly, I don't know, either, either I guess we'd call it today gaslight. No, you don't see that. Or a promise is promises. Okay, we'll have this, you know, a period of adjustment when these terrible things may manifest. But don't worry. I promise you, sometime down the line, we will continue to build our socialism and eventually uh, have communism. Of course, uh, the Communist Party of China claims that right down to the present. And and maybe, maybe billionaires are a small price to pay in contemporary China and terrible Gini coefficients and all the other inequalities we see exploding across China um, are a terrible price to pay. And certainly there are kind of what I call socialistic kind of things you can identify in China as signs of hope. But again, do you want to uh, go based, do you want to do your assessment based on promises? Uh, by that definition, we should take Trump's word for it that he wants to make, build, you know, what, what's his slogan? MAGA, you know, make America great again. He just has to put children in cages as a necessary evil. So likewise, I don't want to ju- assess what's going on in China based on what they promise, um, I don't know, I have a fundamental distrust of political elites, and instead look at what's unfolding. Um, yeah. Yeah, that sounds absolutely right. Something that I know listeners have heard me say before is Eric Hobsbawm writes when he's writing about, uh, the, 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 the dawn of what he would say the revolutionary era is the late 18th century. And he says that everyone, the liberals, the anarchists, the communists, the socialists, whatever you describe them, they are all promising the, the same thing. And honestly, anarchy is sort of the promise from all of them. We're, once we get through to the other side, we should have, you know, limited state, limited government. Everyone will just do whatever they want to do, and it will work out great. That's actually, I mean, <laughs> as, a, as as an anarchist, and indeed as a, you know, whatever a liberal Democrat, I I knew that Marx claimed that the state was not the the goal of of communism. Anarchy is generally the goal. Certainly, I, I, liberalism as well sort of claims that out of laissez-faire capitalism and the Supreme Court, somehow something like anarchy will eventually uh, occur. That, that tends to be the promise, is that something that looks quite anarchistic is coming. When you've got a reformer or a radical, they're usually promising something like anarchy down the line. And it's, <laughs> it, it seems like uh, they never get there on the way, do they? So it's wonderful to have a promise or a vision or idea of what you want to be working towards. But how do you go about testing that? You know, I, I, 
I, I tell people I only know one one line from the Bible: "By your fruit shall I know thee," and I find that very helpful. Um, I mean, I, I never drank the Obama Kool Aid because I saw him install Rahm Emanuel as his chief of staff, and he can do that guy's history. So I, I you know, I, I, it became easy to be very critical and skeptical. And again, this I, some people accuse me of being cynical, and I, I see it the exact opposite. I see well. I want the vision that he's preaching um, and, and change I could believe in. And I wanted to hold his feet to the fire now, not say, okay, Raman, we need to Rahm Emanuel's around for the foreseeable future, but don't worry, trust us, you know, someday in the future, things will be better. And yet we see the Gini coefficient, that measure of inequality continue, whether it's Democrat or Republican in office. So I see it as a very looking at, you know, by the fruits as they're manifesting themselves right away um, as a great predictor of what sort of um, vision you're actually enacting that, you know, kind of like, like I said, sort of anarchism 101, 101. Do you look at, at, at the means or just focus on the ends? And I'm afraid the means to me are more persuasive than the ends. And now what, 50 years after the end of the Mao era in 1976, when Mao dies, we have a pretty enough distance from that, that, uh, that we may be continuing to project our fantasies of an anti-capitalist alternative on what was an intense form of state capitalism um, I don't. I don't understand why that's part of anyone's political project. Um, I can understand salvaging parts of the experiments and looking for, trying to find a society in which the needs of capital weren't constantly placed in front of the needs of human flourishing. So you could see, as you could see in I don't know Scandinavia, good ideas um, for building that better society. But at the end of the day, in a country like China that's rapidly industrializing, that's faced being threatened with nuclear weapons from the United States, Soviet Union, or both, of course, they're going to prioritize industrialization of, at all costs um, and end up sacrificing what is the anarchist um, tendencies, or threads that permeate Maoism that are attractive to anarchists right down to the present. Some of the fancy sounding uh, stuff that he promised. Um, That's great. That's actually where I wanted to go next. I mean, again, I can do this kind of autobiographically, you know, I, <laughs> again, Mao has never had any appeal to me. I've never, I've never read Mao's works because I felt like I, I knew him by his fruits. But one of the, one of the people I like to talk to about this stuff um, is uh, uh, my friend, Larry. He's an old, uh, SDSer and, you know, certainly described himself as an anarchist these days, but I like to go to him and be like, Hey, Larry, you know, you left us in the sixties, you know, what was it like? And I think probably Carl was playing after one of our conversations like a year ago, I said, Larry, what was the deal with, with Mao? Wasn't it obvious he was a monster? I mean, again, I'll, I'll make the John Lennon reference again. Even John Lennon was like, I mean, come on, we should be skeptical of this guy. And Larry said, I don't know, just like, Maybe we were wrong about him, but in the 60s, he just seemed like he had a vision that was really, really uh, uh, appealing. So can you tell us a bit, I mean, why, what, what, what makes Mao a- appealing? So I can use an autobiographical anecdote as well about the Cultural Revolution and my first exposure to Chinese history as a college student being really attracted not to the, some grandiose idea of what Maoism is, but just a simple idea of the cultural revolution, that if you transform your material reality, in other words, if you get uh, rid of what, what they called bourgeois culture and all the inequalities associated with that and build a different material surrounding uh, that would affect your consciousness. So just like kind of like even without thinking how it would affect your consciousness, that had a fundamental kind of appeal to me long before, you know, 20 years later or 10 years later from that uh, in graduate school, learning about the kind of cynical use of Mao and the Cultural Revolution to get rid of his political adversaries and all of that. Now oh, that stuff came later. The original appeal to it was that philosophical idea that, hey, maybe I could change kind of how I thought, how I related to the universe or at least society uh, through this kind of revolutionary transformation was fun, was very interesting. Of course, plenty of the other ideas, if you just read Maoism as political philosophy, stuff like mass line, that the party would be a vanguard party actually guided by what was uh, the thoughts of, of, of the working, uh, working classes. Um, 
Of course, that sort of thing is appealing. So again, the less you know about what was actually unfolding, the more there is to see something admirable um, in his thought. But of course, that's isn't that always the case? I mean, I imagine you read some MAGA stuff, you could come to similar conclusions that we're all going to go back to the positive part about the 1950s when we knew our neighbors' names and cared about them and had uh, block parties where firemen came and let us ride around in a fire truck. I can, you know, give you stories from my youth that also are, are appealing. But you know, I, I, I don't know. I think it's our job um, to kind of look at the ugly side um, as well, uh, so that we can our takeaways aren't, oh, if only we could get back, if we could make ourselves great again like China was in the Mao era, I mean, give me a break. Um, just like we don't want to make ourselves great again like uh, like America was in the 1950s with all its racism and sexism and so on. Um, so, yeah, I, I could see, I, as you kind of go down the list of Mao as a sort of political philosopher, it's easy to find things to identify. And I would imagine, and so I want to uh, be sympathetic uh, to your friends, when, when their main opponent is what they see going on in the United States, they want to borrow examples of possibilities for something better. But uh, um, like I said, at the takeaway now, the political struggle now is different than the political struggle was then. And, and in my opinion, the political struggle now is about building a, a more equitable um, future uh, that isn't one where you have a tyranny of a state, especially in this era of surveillance and AI. Uh, I don't know how those people imagine a state coming in power and not using those tools for nice sounding things, but that end up being uh, horribly oppressive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, first of all, full, full agreement there, I guess, you know, um, I'm I'm scared to even do this since not only are you the expert on Chinese history, but you're the one who taught me. But just briefly, maybe we should do some some actual history. And I like to do the history myself, and then the expert, you know, f- fixes it. So we, you know, we're we're talking about in terms of Mao taking power in uh, in China. We're talking about a a this very complicated civil war, but in in broad strokes. We have a, a, a U.S. aligned, somewhat revolutionary group yet led by Chiang Kai-shek. And then they are, you know, uh, going to be or supposed to be the U.S. ally. This is why um, the U.S. intends to fully disarm Japan with the idea that they, you know, that they, uh, the U.S. acolyte state in the Pacific will be China. And then um, there is Chiang Kai-shek and his nationalists are defeated. They <laughs> move their version of China to Taiwan, which they still claim is the real China, if I've, if I've got that correctly. Uh, and Mao Zedong uh, takes power. And obviously from the view of the, you know, the, the whatever you want to call them, the West, this is a nightmare. But the positive reading of Mao is that he is going to be be a Leninist revolutionary, precisely as you said, who is more in touch with the agrarian, more in touch with the will of the people, and uh, will not immediately descend in the kind of the kind of bureaucratic state machinery that you get with Trotsky and Stalin. And then, secondarily, I guess in the Cultural Revolution, there's the belief that Mao has has corrected and is going to let the young people. And the and the new energies of the country and the revolution flow in a way that Stalin never never would have. Is that have I got the broad strokes of the history and the appeal of Mao, right? Yes, and, and one I would say you've gotten uh, you touched on very briefly um, a, a kind of central tension here. And one is, do we follow the example of Daga, as they called the Soviet Union, elder brother, their model of what they should be doing? But then, because that model has a couple of decades head start on them, they could see all of the problems emerging and then kind of go back to, well, what can we do about that? So a lot of this, I I think someone accused me of thinking that Mao was a kind of crypto capitalist who was always bent on a sort of capitalist revolution. I take him at his word that they wanted to build the egalitarian, they wanted to, as they said, build socialism. I have no reason to doubt that. Uh, But... Instead, I look at those kind of constraints on 
why they weren't able to do, do that. And the, the shortest way to describe that is, to, again, two nuclear powers on their border that at any one time was constantly threatening them. So, yeah, why do you need to kind of build up rather than dismantle a state? Why do you feel you need to? It's pretty easy to see that. And that sort of feeling threatened persists right down to the present. I should kind of say that um, I think a lot of this sort of uh, rebirth of the Cold War vis-a-vis China is a continuation of the same kind of thing. Oh, we we like to use them as the bogeyman. Oh, that they're going to take over the world, do these all sorts of awful, quote-unquote, socialist things uh, to us. Um, but I see them as fundamentally weak uh, versus, versus the um, most powerful capitalist intense countries and them kind of trying to respond to that. Um, that, that for me is a better explanation of the kind of neo-Cold War we see re-emerging rather than a kind of Orientalist Fu Manchu description of an evil, you know, Fu Manchu-like people who, for the sake of domination, want to take over the world. So I see whether it's in the 1950s and facing those threats then or in the 21st century facing these threats now, it constrains what their political possibilities are if they feel like they're constantly facing threat of being, you know, invaded, attacked or undermined through cyberbullying or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. No, I, that's that's so interesting. I, I, the first obvious parallel is is to the Soviet Union. And then just the the difficulty. I mean, I I think you and I might have uh, might have connected, uh, reconnected via Facebook. I've since gotten rid of all social media. Although I think Everyday Anarchism Podcast might still have an Instagram account that I that I don't use anymore. I should figure out how to deactivate that. But this is the problem. I think podcasts are different. That it's you can have a nuanced conversation on a podcast. But this is the problem with social media and Twitter and all that stuff. It's so hard to get right. So just using the Soviet Union as an example, and then we can get to China. I have, you know, absolutely no sympathy to the Soviet Union as it existed, except insofar as they, you know, they were a country that as soon as it was created, basically every power in the world um, invaded it with uh, the goal of, of toppling that government. And I, I I am trying to you know f- fight a two front war. Maybe that's a maybe that's a bad metaphor. You know the 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 clumsy vulgar anti communists who hated the Soviet Union and hated Mao because they were on the left. Those those people are are wrong. But the people who celebrated Mao and Stalin because they were on the left, those people are wrong also. And so then the challenge is to understand why it made sense to do it the way they did because they were facing imperialism without saying, oh, well, you know, they did the best they could and it's too bad all those people died and we have to support them because they are the left. Wow. So, okay. I'm not sure if this is a direct response to what you're saying, but it's certainly something I want to communicate to people listening. Again, going back to that theme is this isn't his, his smarty pants historians with 2020 glasses. There were people at the time inside and outside of China, both then and now, who were looking at this third kind of like, gee, I don't like either of these options. What does another option look like? So there were, for instance, Trotskyists like Tony Cliff. He wrote a textbook that that that's my favorite citation in my book. And by the way, all my books you can download for free uh, on academia.edu. If you Google search academia.edu and look for me, you can download them and find this specific citation I'm talking about. Tony Cliff wrote a textbook in the late 1950s that predicted a great famine in China before it actually happened based on what? Looking at what the Soviet Union did of saying, well, in order for primitive accumulation, in other words, to get the initial capital we need for industrialization, we can either import it and become subservient of international capital, or we can do what the Soviet Union did and squeeze it out of the countryside to the point of famine there. Uh, so this guy predicted it in the future. And I love that citation because I don't I don't say, oh, how could we have known? There were people whose analysis was clearly known, and that's conveniently swept under the rug. Um, 
just as there is in, con in contemporary times now. You can look for the voices of people who were actually right at the time and try to restore their kind of rightful place as a good guide to who do you listen to? The people who had a, lots of oopsies? <laughs> How could we have known? <laughs> or the people that got it right in the first place and kind of reconstruct how they got it right. That's what I feel like I'm doing in that last book, Unending Capitalism, is the title of that book, how consumerism negated China's revolution. In other words, how consumerism, this demand side of, of, of capitalism, led the Chinese Communist Party to do the opposite, build the opposite of what they claimed to be building. So yeah, I, I'm with you in that it's, it's really great to take your cues from people whose political analysis was right at the time. Yeah, and, and I think it's very important to remember, I mean, again, with respect to the Soviet Union, which I know that story so much better, that there was always, and again, I, I barely knew about these people before I was looking into anarchism, but there was always an, an, an anti-Soviet Union left that was also anti-capitalist. There were always people who saw what was wrong with the Soviet Union and saw what was wrong with imperialist capitalism and were, were, were trying to walk between those. And I would say I'm trying to do that. And, and I can tell you, they were told at the time that it was just a fool's errand, that you have to pick one, that it's silly to not align yourself with one of these two uh, tendencies. And I, I'm with you. That that can't be right. That can't be right. Yeah. That, like I said earlier, the gaslighting or the accusations that you're somehow politically naive. Again, you one is welcome to say, hey, you need a nasty, powerful um, state in order to break some eggs to make your omelet, so to speak. Uh, but why not be open about that? <laughs> why not? What's that? A piss on someone and tell me it's raining or something like why? Why try to gaslight or tell us otherwise build it into your kind of political theory a little bit more explicitly hey guys you're going to have to sign on to temporarily some awful things and hopefully that will won't be necessary for a long period of time yeah instead they sort of want you to want to tell you that well, they don't want to own up to that in, in my experience and i don't understand that i like to be as transparent and open explicit as possible yeah i uh I was discussing recently the concept of a of a climate leviathan, which I am. I mean, listeners must know I am. I am against this idea. It's not that I'm not really, really working towards and believing in changes in how we deal with the climate, but the idea that what we need is a just a more powerful government. I think that's a bad idea. But I respect that people are willing to claim that they want a climate leviathan as opposed to the people who will argue for a climate leviathan and if you confront them on it be like well i don't want i mean i i just run into this i want to get back to china in in a second because so, so that we take advantage of your expertise but just chatting with you and talking about similar experiences i run into so many people this was a big deal in covid they were like i want those people who are not wearing their masks to go to jail and i would say like well you know that's kind of spread covid really bad and like well you know i mean well, no i don't really mean that i want them to go to jail but there should be enforcement and i would say well enforcement means jail you need to decide do you uh, do you want the police to shoot them i see you have a black lives matter sign in your yard and people were just they just they don't they they're like no i'm, I'm not going to sign up for these covid deniers or non-maskers to go to jail but i really want the government to do something about them and I, that means jail and I can't, I can't get people to accept this. So I, I take, I, I take it as a positive if they'll say, I want a climate Leviathan. It's better than arguing for a climate Leviathan and claiming you're not. Yeah. Um, once again, I completely agree with you. And this isn't theory for me. Um, you can see the kind of use of the climate uh, to advanced uh, capitalist agenda right down the block from me where they shoved a giant new, um, condo complex uh, and decided it required, we're in California here, zero parking spots because it was near a transit cor corridor. And they told, they told us, the local population here, if you're against it, you hate unhoused people and you hate and you want the climate change. You're a climate denier. So again, who's calling? We might come to the same conclusion, but people like me and my neighbors are calling for a democratic discussion about how to get there, an open discussion, not a sort of 
you know, again, piss on me and tell me it's raining or tell me that I'm somehow an awful person or something like that. Uh, but yeah, you know, one of the other things that I feel sparked by what, what you said is that uh, my, my coming to the sort of conclusions that I have politically required a lot of soul searching about my own personal psychology and why I needed other people to suffer and why I needed the state to make them stop, suffer. Um, that was a lot of very difficult stuff to own up on, of sort of revenge or they need to be taught a lesson or, well, why, you know, where was that coming from? Why did I need that? I found it quite liberating to... Uh, think about how my uh, personal politics, my political, my politics corresponded with some, some frankly, some of my psychology. Uh, I would invite people to look at the correlation between those two things. I found that some of my uh, hardcore Marxist-Leninist colleagues somehow imagined that if just someone like them were in charge of a giant bureaucratic state, that it would magically be, be transformed into a wonderful operation. In other words, they somehow believe that good people in bad institutions would yield good institutions when, I'm sorry, the entire history of the 20th century <laughs> suggests suggests otherwise. So yeah, a lot of, I would invite people, uh, the benefits that I personally have found, results may vary, but I personally have found that kind of introspecting about why I you know, need my enemies, uh, my political enemies, or foes to live the horrible consequences of some of their politics rather than sort of, as you say, model a kind of better alternative. Yeah, I'm a vegetarian and early vegetarianism or veganism 101 is don't persuade people by shaming them. Yeah. Persuade people by inviting them over to the dinner and reassuring them that they could eat, 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 eat equal or better. Yeah, I would say the same applies to politics generally. It's, a, it's certainly a, a lot harder to do, especially when you're confronted by, you know, gaslighting, much more powerful uh, people telling you you're a, either politically naive or you're a commie and that's somehow a terrible thing and so on. <laughs> you want to fight fire with fire, in other words. Uh, but yeah, that doesn't yield. Do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? Get people to think about that. So this is, I mean, this is perfect because this will bring us back to the the Chinese story of what Mao actually did. So it seems like Mao, if, if we if we take him at his word, and it seems like you do take him at his word, you know, was a did did have the right ideas, was trying to create the kind of world that we all want to live in. So besides the uh, you know besides the way that industrialism led to consumerism, or maybe that's the key answer. What what goes wrong from Mao, this thinker who you say has has resonances with anarchism? How do we go from that thinker to this to this what do we call him ruler dictator who does not have resonances with anarchism? Well, uh, two different responses uh, to that, but one thing I want to get across to people um, is the differences. I think this is a persistent theme here: is the difference differences between words and deeds. So, socialist words and policy deeds and outcomes. Um, I believe that they were on end, they were negating or destroying the old goals of the revolution because they were propagating. Here's what we're building. Here's what we're building. Here's what we're building. And then when they split with the Soviet Union in the 1960s, they say that's what a restoration of capitalism looks like. That's what a restoration of capitalism looks like. And guess what? Everything in that they're using their state mass media to disseminate across their country far and wide, people could easily look around and say, well, gee, that looks mighty similar to what we actually experienced as well. So they were not only not doing what they were say, said they were doing, but they were introducing doubts. So one of the kind of conclusions I reach in that book of unending capitalism is to say our default position isn't to say, well, sure, it may have seemed like uh, uh, state capitalism from 30,000 feet all these years later, but people at the time, they, bought, they drank the punch and this is what they thought. No, I think our default position uh, is that we should assume there was doubt or uncertainty or what the hell sort of socialism this looks like, or gee, this looks awfully like what they told me is going on in the Soviet Union as well. 
Um, so that creates this sort of social tensions that we see explode in the cultural revolution with uh, all of those hierarchies and inequalities, which are, again, incredibly easy to, to view from the point of consumerism. After all, I can reduce a lot of the argument of that book is when you start to industrialize, guess what? You start making more wristwatches, bicycles, sewing machines and other consumer uh, stuff. Who gets the first of those? Who gets the second, the third, and so on? And what sort of inequalities then are you uh, thereby introducing? And how then does that create labor multipliers that lead to increasing inequality? So again, what I'm sort of suggesting here is that Mao and the Chinese communists themselves are giving people the tools to, to that fuel the doubts that explode um, in the Cultural Revolution in 1966. Um, yeah, but I, I think there's a different part of your question uh, that uh, why they ended up uh, uh, doing this. Well, that, that keeps going back to me to that the short answer to that is threat. Plus, you want to feed your population. So it's the same old stuff uh, you see throughout hi history, namely, how do you stay in power? Well, staying in power 101 is feeding the population and trying to suppress any signs of rebellion. Those things are, too usually, uh, are, are usually linked, or in this case, foreign conquest. So fending off the foreigners required either arming everyone to the teeth, and China does a lot, some of that uh, through militia, um, and or you know, feeding your population sufficiently. Um, and to, for, for both of those things to happen, um, especially after 1949, when China sees you know, peace dividend of an exploding, uh, exploding population side, it needs to ramp up the production of chemical fertilizers. And to do so, it needs to import technology. So not only do you need to import technology so you can fend off the imperialist powers, technology in the form of weapons, uh, but you also need to import that technology in the form of stuff like fertilizer production plants. And if you look at the late 70s, when China starts to reintegrate into market as opposed to state capitalist markets, um, you see that's the first order of business is to buy exactly that stuff, chemical fertilizer plants, start feeding the population. So yeah, there's a kind of... I don't know, compulsion. Um, I talk about, you know, capitalism is self-expanding and compulsory. It's hard to escape it. If you, if you want to survive, you need a wage. And if you need a wage, you need to participate in markets. Likewise, if China wants to survive, it has to compete in international markets. And to do that, you can see it all the way down to the factory floor. You're not going to be able to export your second-rate bicycles to, to developing countries in, say, Africa, as China was then doing, unless there's a product quality. And make sure you have that product quality of international standards. You need to impose labor discipline all the way down to the factory floor. At least that's what the conclusion that they reached. So you can see that sort of negation occurring just about everywhere you look. And, you know, as I know we're heading towards the end of this. I like, I like to think that people can kind of take this alternative view and look at the evidence and decide whether it fits the pieces better, better for themselves. Sort of make for me a lot of pieces didn't fit and still, until I started to see China as a variety, a shifting variety of capitalism, of industrial capitalism on a spectrum ranging from one extreme that never exists called state capitalism to another extreme called Milton Friedman's dream of market, uh, perfect market capitalism or perfect uh, private capitalism. At one extreme, you have the state controlling all capital and how it is distributed. So through planning and state ownership to it. Another extreme, it's all private and market mediated. There's China is constantly shifting among those varieties. And, and those reasons that it's shifting are usually in service of co continued rapid accumulation, not in, oh my God, we're suddenly restoring capitalism a la the Soviet Union. We'd better restore labor rights and their control over the social surplus. No, that's not what we see. It's all Those shifts are always, uh, as they are today, the shift back towards greater state capitalism that we see in China isn't a sudden, it isn't to my mind the way that some might view it. We're taking a couple of steps towards socialism and we're actually building it and suddenly we step back. But instead, it makes it fits the pieces together much more convincingly and comprehensively if we see it as shifting varieties aiming towards prioritizing the needs of capital, period, simple. Yeah. Um, again, I'm, I'm struck by, despite the fact that they had that example already, how similar it is to the story in the Soviet Union, the way the factories in the Soviet Union 
were often run by the people who had been running them previously. The owners and the overseers were, were thrown off, thrown out at the beginning of the revolution, but then they decided, you know, in the name of efficiency, it was a good communist efficiency. We had to make enough goods. They, they started running the factories the same way. I guess the last thing I want to do before I see if there's anything else you want to say is see if I can get the get the gist of the narrative right, restated in my uh, non-expert terms. So we've we've got a successful revolution in 1949 in a country that has been modernizing and industrializing over the past few decades. But as a as a country that was, what did they, I mean, what did they call it? It was it was it was in some ways. Um, weaker and controlled by the West in the late 19th and early 20th century. So it didn't experience, it wasn't in charge of its own industrialization in the way, say, Japan was. And so then the project is to build the revolution, but it's to build the revolution in an industrial world and also to build a revolution that is able to protect itself from openly, the openly imperialist power of the United States and its allies and the somewhat less open, but nevertheless, obviously imperialist and quite militarized power of the Soviet Union. The way you do that is factories and rapid industrialization. And when you have industrialization of this kind, precisely as Kropotkin would have predicted, you're going to get consumerism, capitalism, hierarchies, bureaucracies, and no matter what your intentions, when you go down that road, that's that's what you get. Am I am I understanding the narrative correctly? Yeah. So does that mean another possibility wasn't out there? That's the, that's my that's my that was my only other question to you. So I would say maybe we just can't look at the 20th century and see that. So we can look at the 20th century and much like in Scandinavia, find what I would describe as socialistic experiments that are wonderful um, towards building a more egalitarian society. The way that, say, UBI might be a wonderful uh, experiment towards uh, creating a more egalitarian society. But whether that's negating capitalism and replacing it with socialism, uh, we don't... I, I don't see that. I don't think the history of the 20th century demonstrates that. So when you view things the way that I'm describing, uh, the end, the death of Mao and the quote unquote restoration of capitalism in China isn't a surprise at all. You don't have that giant, well, oh, if only they had continued down that path. Mm-hmm. If they continued down that path, maybe they would have had put some more bandages on the version of capitalism that they were building, and it, it would have stayed more on the state controlled, and maybe the Gini coefficient wouldn't have exploded the way it did in the 90s and since then in particular. Um, but I, I don't think the historical record uh, supports that interpretation. So if you want to look at these, this kind of stuff critically, but optimistically and sympathetically, you do exactly what you describe. You describe, you look at the forces that prevented them from enacting those experiments to a much a wider a degree, and you look at some kernels of experiments. I, I've sort of told my graduate students that what I think the next wave of, of research would be socialism despite socialism. By that, I mean <laughs> socialism despite state socialism, or as I prefer to call it, state capitalism, or as a variety of state capitalism. In other words, where on the local levels were they actually trying to take the party at its word, learning those lessons that they were being taught and saying, hey, maybe we need to try this, maybe we need to try that. But I don't know, the history of the world kind of demonstrates to me that when you try to do that in a latecomer to industrial capitalism vis-a-vis much more heavily armed and, or, and frankly also enticing through their lifestyles um, model out there, it's really very difficult to do that. So if you're kind of proposing in the 21st century here a radical alternative uh, to, to what we face now in financial capitalism, um, I don't think saying, hey, we need to go back and you know get the next Mao to take over our country and so on, have a vanguard party, and that's going to lead to all sorts of wonderful things. That's not what the historical record shows to me. So it's salvage the things that are salvageable, but but also be sure to Hold in your head those two contradictory thoughts that there could have been some really wonderful things uh, going on there, some admirable things that maybe we want to try to reintroduce and expand, but at the same time, some horrific uh, cautionary tales of like what happens when you have when you build up a powerful state. I guess the last thing to say is the lesson it seems to me is it's our job 
in you know in, in the in the democratic countries or supposedly democratic countries that we are in to do our best to not take part in the imperialist project and to do our best insofar as we can to prevent our governments from taking part in imperialist projects. If the story of the Soviet Union and China is both they have to go down this road because the alternative is invasion and destruction. Well, the potentially invading and destroying countries, there's the fascists, obviously, and then there's also the United States and and its allies. And it sounds like, in part, China's history could have been different if the U.S. history had been had been different. If we hadn't used our power to threaten the bejeepers out of them and still do that to this day uh, through our quadruple the size of their military spending, um, force them or at least make them feel for us. I mean, I felt this way after 9-11 in 2001, that we were at this crossroads where we could take all the goodwill in the world and strengthen international institutions and norms, or we could do what we do, say, screw you, UN, we're going to invade whomever we want to invade, whenever we want to invade. What sort of model is that setting? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I agree with you that that stopping war and not buying it, boy, it was just unbelievable how quickly people could just see things in black and white terms uh, on the Soviet Union, uh, sorry, Soviet Union, whoops, uh, Russia invading Ukraine. Um, I, I, they just couldn't for the life of them seem to hold two contradictory thoughts that I could simultaneously, absolutely positively oppose the invasion of one country into another country. But at the same time, I could see it as a proxy war uh, being waged uh, uh, on Russia the way that, say, Taiwan might be used as a proxy war um, on China. I don't understand why why people just so quick to put up their kind of Ukrainian flags and yeah. see it as a good versus a struggle between good versus evil. Um, and that, thereby I, I, come to the conclusion that this finally was the good war that they could stand behind. Um, I'm guessing if they had children of draftable ages and we still had a draft, they might be more reluctant uh, yeah, know, I think I've only gotten yeah, two pieces twice. of Sorry. like hate mail um, in my entire time. One one was about vaccines, and the other mm. was you know saying that I was a that I was a shill for NATO because of my uh, opposition to Putin's invasion and my support for I mean whatever you want to call it support for Ukraine's resistance, sure, but support for the country of Ukraine. And I mean, I didn't wave the, I didn't wave the flag and I, uh, you know, people are all enthusiastic that Zelensky and his government have banned Ukrainians from leaving the country because they have to fight. I, it doesn't seem that people can hold these, these two ideas in their head at the same time. I'll give you a, you, we should make a, a collective list of these kind of things or when we're being baited and when we might invite the person asking the question to kind of take a deeper look at their personal psychology and why they need to give me an, I got you, you're actually an evil off. You know, as a vegan, you can imagine how many times people are like, are your shoes leather? And you know, they're kind of like constantly looking for this sort of exception that proves that I'm a giant hypocrite or something like that. Uh, but so going back to China, here's an example that I get all the time is get me in hot water. Tibet, well, you know, surely you must advocate for the liberation of Tibet. And I'm like, well, here's another example where I can hold two contradictory positions. I'm for the liberation of Hubei, you know, Hubei <laughs> province in China for any kind of self-determination. Uh, but I'm also understanding that the Chinese let go of their control over Tibet, the U.S. would have missiles there the next day. And therefore, in the world that we currently live in, I could simultaneously book be, uh, be both for uh, self determination of everywhere, but understand why that's um, you know, why one country is not going to unilaterally uh, disarm, especially if it for the last hundred fifty years has been at a strategic and military vast disadvantage to another country. Um, it goes back to that kind of like, what are we doing in this country to build international institutions or create different norms so that they don't have to. Instead, you know, what is it about our personal psychology that wants them to somehow set the perfect magical example of peace and harmony um, in the face of, of what we're doing? We can see the same stuff, kind of stuff with climate change. You know, to, uh, we can't possibly do anything here because the Chinese are secretly. <laughs> can you believe this sort of conspiracy theory that the Chinese, this, the, that it's, uh, climate change is a hoax? 
uh, perpetrated by the Chinese to get us to unilaterally uh, become uncompetitive. I, I hadn't <laughs> heard that one lately, but yeah. <laughs> it didn't, it didn't play its part in, in that already. Um, yeah, I think. I mean, I think <laughs> we said we said we were going to wrap up, but I think this is really yeah. this is really important. This idea that you know, I think you know, the, someone called me like a NATO shell or or something like that, and it's just it's. <sighs> To get people to, it seems very difficult to take the position that so much of what NATO does is a provocation to Russia, and also the position that so much of what Vladimir Putin does has been absolutely monstrous. <laughs> it seems like you have to either say either he, you know, it was, it was a good, smart, indeed humane thing to invade Ukraine because of what evil NATO did. Or, you know, you have to be wearing, you know, NATO camos to work. Like, why Why are those the only two options? It's 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 frustrating. But now I'm just yammering on. Uh, this has been I'm such yammering a on too, yeah. way outside my um, <laughs> bailiwick of kind of modern Chinese history. But I keep com- kind of coming. B- but I think these kind of things are kind of related. And that the ways I'm kind of trying to figure out ways to introduce this to my teaching where the kind of historical explanations you gravitate towards become a way of telling you what's going on inside you and and how you're thinking about lots of other issues. Because if you're kind of looking for this evil, you know, good versus evil struggle where want you're absolutely positively convinced of that, that that to me is an invitation for kind of not only a deepening of your understanding of the world out there, but kind of the one within yourself. I'm sorry to sound, you know, California woo woo at the end of this, but uh, that's that's kind of been one of my takeaways uh, from all of this is a lot of introspection because yeah, I see that the people have been the nastiest towards me. Uh, to my from my observation of them, to the extent that I know them, is that they're generally pretty kind of nasty about lots of things, cynical, angry. Um, all of that, and they, when I view them and think about, well, gee, if they, if only they took over the uh, over the state, I, I don't see us as creating um, some kind of magical other alternative to to what we saw in the 20th century. So, yeah, I, I think, and that, that ultimately for me is also, if we want to end this on a kind of hopeful note, is a kind of you know, remembering that there's that kind of engaging with the world and trying to be more of an advocate. And I, and I admire those people, including you through this podcast, uh, but also that you can start that work at home with yourself <laughs> and, and investigating where you find that ah, a little bit of evil here would be okay because it would be in service of something good down the line. That's, that's something politically you can work on, work on. Um, if the personal is political, as we learned from that wave of feminism, that applies to all areas. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I mean, you know, Ursula Le Guin came to anarchism through Taoism. This this connection and, you know, transcendentalism, which it was was taken up by Emma Goldman and Voltaire Claire as a form of anarchism, came in, to a certain extent with uh, Emerson's engagement with Hinduism and, and Buddhism. So this this sense that the search in the se- inside the self and then sh- seeing that the bad political stuff, the domination, the hierarchy, the quest for certainties and absolutes, seeing that outside as a manifestation of what comes from inside, I think that's absolutely been part of the history of anarchism. You know, and uh, one last plug for Brett O'Shea and Rev Left. I've been amazed by how he's been really open about his both meditation and Buddhist practice. That someone who would be hard, you know, nominally a hardcore Marxist Leninist type and, you know, seem what you stereotype typically would associate with those person as angry at the world will also be so search his own kind of personal psychology to see how that affects his politics. I don't know, maybe that's something kind of hopeful in the 21st century. I certainly noticed that it's kind of awareness along a younger generation. You probably see this in your students as well, that they're kind of, they're, they are to us as we are to our parents in terms of kind of awareness of their own personal psychologies and kind of taking ownership for a lot more of that. And yeah, so like I said, I would 
tell your audience who's made it this far in the podcast to kind of <laughs> kind of look at the, the historical explanations they gravitate towards and why they gravitate towards those kind of explanations and what that may tell them about their personal psychology that just talking to their shrink or a good friend or their romantic partner or whatever it is might not tell them. Um, yeah, it's kind of... It's a fun way to kind of try to rope people into saying, oh, we're not just studying the Mongols for the sake of studying, you know, 12th century uh, Chinese uh, or sorry, 12th century Asian um, empires, but rather is kind of introspecting about how we make sense of the world. It's kind of like a good hook for roping in students to yeah. Yeah, I think it's want to be interested in historical issues. Yeah, This idea that if you need a Leviathan, that's responding to something inside of you. I think that's I think that's great advice for people, and I think that's a great place to end. Yeah. Carl, thank thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for your support. Thank you for that wonderful class. Oh, almost twenty five years ago. I think that was two thousand one. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me on your podcast and for being such an inspiration for the rest of us. It was a real pleasure. Thanks, Carl. Take care.